named Susan from Uganda. She's 14 years old and from a strictly Islamic family. One day a visiting speaker came to her school. He spoke about this guy called Jesus who claimed he was the son of God and had come to save the world. And right there, Susan decided to give her life to Jesus. When she got home, her father found out and he was furious. In fact, on one occasion in broad daylight, he grabbed Susan and her younger brother and dragged them outside. He held a knife to their throat and said, Susan, if you do not stop going to church and worshiping God, I will kill you and your brother. But Susan didn't stop. Her father grabbed her. He took her to a room in their house and placed a mat on the floor. He told Susan to sit on that mat and do not move until you are willing to deny Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour. Her father turned around, walked out of the room and locked the door. Susan's father didn't return to that room for three months. The only way Susan survived was that while her father was out, her brother would dig a hole under the door. He would pour water into it for Susan to lap up. On occasion, he would fry up some banana and slide that under the door to his sister. After about three months, the neighbours began to wonder where Susan was and they asked her brother. He told them and they immediately called the police. When they came, they opened the door and they found Susan. She was sitting on the mat. She was alive, but only just. You see, the bones in her legs had begun to grow and conform to the way she had been sitting. And she weighed 20 kilos. They grabbed her and rushed her to hospital where they began to rehabilitate her. When Susan was asked why she hadn't tried to escape, why she hadn't even left the mat, without missing a beat, she replied, because my father said, if I was to leave that mat, I would be denying Jesus. And I couldn't do that. One of the most incredible stories I've ever heard from the persecuted church of a Christ-centered passion about this guy called Peter from North Africa. He was arrested when police stormed into the secret Christian gathering that he was attending. He was caught and held for six years without charge in some of the most horrific conditions I've ever heard of. On one occasion, Peter was locked in a cell so narrow that he could only lie down. Essentially a coffin for five months. They took him straight from this coffin and placed him in an underground cell, completely dark, and they left him there for a further six months. When they finally pulled him out of this hole, he said not only was he almost completely blind, but his legs were paralysed. And over the coming months, by the grace of God, he says, my sight returned and my legs were healed. The police would regularly pull him in and say, Peter, we want you to sign this piece of paper, which literally said, I will not speak about Jesus. I will not meet with Christians. And on each occasion, he would refuse to sign it. One day, Peter and two fellow Christian inmates resolved to escape with no shoes and just the clothes on their backs, under a hail of gunfire, they ran for their lives. In fact, Peter didn't stop walking for more than 200 kilometres until he reached the relative safety of a refugee camp. And as he spoke about the last six years of his life, he said he realised that not only had he lost his freedom, but he lost time. He said, I'm almost 40 years old, I'm, I'm not trained, I'm not educated. I may never get married or have a family of my own. But then he stopped and smiled and he said, but I still have Jesus and he's worth it all. Deny Jesus and live or choose not to and die. 
is a question that strikes fear into the heart of most Christians and forces us to question our faithfulness in God. But for two incredible girls from Iran, girls my age, this was their reality. Miriam and Marzier were placed into a situation where denying Jesus would literally save their lives. You see, they'd been sentenced to death by hanging, having been caught after distributing more than 20,000 Bibles in Tehran. But for the majority of times, they would fill a backpack with Bibles, pray and ask God where they should distribute them, and then under the cover of darkness, they would simply place these Bibles in letterboxes. When they were caught, they were placed into Evan Prison, one of the most notorious prisons on the planet. And they told me stories of friends who were regularly beaten, tortured, abused, and even killed. But as their case reached global media and pressure mounted for their release, the girls, they were regularly dragged before a judge who would simply say, write one sentence, saying that you'll convert from Christianity to Islam and we'll let you go. And each time they'll refuse. And the judge would grow more and more frustrated and say, no, you don't understand. If you don't do this, you will die here. And they replied, no, you don't understand. We've been threatened with death before. That's not the problem. We're not afraid of death. What we're afraid of is a life without faith, without our Saviour, Jesus Christ. You know, we so often link stories of victory, miraculous provision, with God's faithfulness. But have we made a horrible mistake in doing this? Is God any less faithful in the countless stories that involve hardship, suffering and loss? One of the biggest struggles in my own journey has been the fact that, well, I seem to equate God's faithfulness with his provision of safety. And it's essentially rendered Jesus as this kind of blend between Superman and Santa Claus, a, a superhero that will sweep in and save the day wherever, whenever, and however I need him. And in those moments when my prayer isn't answered immediately or how I want it to be answered, I question God's faithfulness. What most people don't know with Miriam and Marzier is that their safety, it came at a huge cost. Physical and emotional scars are run deep. The death of many close friends. And yes, their story ends the way we like it, released after 259 days with one of those exciting stories that we all crave. But trust in God's faithfulness, that's what defines this story, because whether it worked out the way we all wanted it to or not, it wouldn't have changed a thing. You see, their lawyer would tell them, if you convert to Islam, we can exploit a loophole. It allows you to tell a lie of convenience. And they would reply and say, we will never convert, not even for the sake of momentary convenience. It's stories like Miriam and Marzier, who because of Jesus, they stand in the face of culture in some of the most confrontational places on the planet. They're stories that inspire us, encourage us. But do they change us? Because Jesus isn't a mix between Superman and Santa Claus. And by following him, we don't get a life of safety. We get a great commission that involves suffering, hardship, but an assurance of eternity with him. A story, it may not end the way we want, but ultimately, God is always faithful. is always faithful. Amen? Hallelujah. That's just three of countless 
stories of those who have been persecuted for the cause of Christ. As a matter of fact, the New Testament that we read and that we preach from was written by men who were persecuted for the cause of Christ. Hallelujah. I played that audio this morning and I've already made mention of it several times because today is the International Day of Prayer. And I want to talk for a few moments this morning about our brothers and sisters who are persecuted around the world. While the church in America sits and thinks that well, persecution's coming, it's on the horizon, it's way off in the distance, persecution has already arrived for them. While we sit on our padded pews in our air-conditioned buildings and say, it's going to get bad, it's already gotten bad for them. I want to read to you this morning a little bit of statistics. In North Korea, it is believed that between 50,000 and 70,000 Christians are being held in detention camps. The World Watch List, which ranks countries where Christians face the most persecution, has placed North Korea number one for 13 consecutive years. They said this, it is number one on our list because it is the most brutal and dangerous place in the world to be a Christian because the government requires and enforces with hostility a total dedication of hero worship to their leader. They went on to say that Islamic extremism accounts for the main source of persecution in 40 of the top 50 countries that are ranked on their list. Now, did you hear that? Extreme Islamic, Islamic extremism it, it accounts for the main source of persecution of Christians in 40 of the 50 top countries that they have on their list of countries where there is persecution. The violence and hostility endured by Christians throughout the Middle East and Africa at the hands of the Islamic State and other terrorist groups was also well documented in this story that I read. Over the past year, especially, Christians in Iraq and Syria have been killed for refusing to abandon their faith and to join ISIS and their radical theology. The WWL reports that approximately 100 million Christians are persecuted worldwide. The type, this type of persecution analyzed ranged from government inflicted to violence that is carried out by terror groups. Now I realize in America, this morning we were free to get up and to get ready for church. We were free to come to this place and worship the Lord. So maybe we don't realize what's happening and we're not seeing it to the degree like these other countries are, but who knows how long it'll be before we do. Because we are seeing terrorist attack after terrorist attack by extreme Islam, by Islamic extremists on our country's soul. While our government sits with blindfolds on and allows more and more of them into our country to destroy us from within. Abraham Lincoln once said that if America is destroyed, it won't be from without, but it will be from within. And we are seeing that in our nation today. Islam is not a religion of peace. It is a religion of hatred. It is a religion that says if you do not believe what we believe, we will kill you. Christianity is not a religion. It is a relationship. But if you look at it as a religion, it is a doctrine, maybe I should put it that way, a teaching that says... If you do not believe the way we do, we will pray for you. How many people would rather have somebody pray for you than kill you? Amen? Amen. So here you have their religion saying, and we've got pastors across our nation trying to join the two together. Can't do it. Because the religion of Islam is evil, it is wicked, it is demonic, it is of Satan. While Christianity, true, pure Christianity... Is a relationship with the Prince of Peace, the God of the universe, the Great I Am, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, the healer of the sick, 
the great physician. It is a relationship with Jesus Christ that says, if you do not believe like me, if you're an Islamist out there, I pray for you that you'll get right, that you'll accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior before it's eternally too late. Not one that stands up and says, if you're not like we are, if you don't believe like we do, we're going to cut your head off. But that's exactly what goes on in these countries to our brothers and sisters that are persecuted for the cause of Christ. I remember one story that I read in the Voice of Martyrs magazine some years ago now. I can't recall all the details except for the horror, the horrific ones. It had to do with a girl that had snuck off to go and do what? Together together with some believers. She'd already been warned, don't do that. Because you will be killed for doing it. Yet she risked her life to go to what we would call church. Amen. A little, a small gathering of believers to share some scripture, to share some prayer. And on her way back, as she ran across the field, and I don't know if it was her, I don't know if it was her kinfolk, I don't know if it was someone who owned her. I don't know if she was a slave. I don't know what the, the exact details are. But this man saw her and he knew where she'd been. And he stopped her and he said, I know where you've been. And I warned you what I would do. And he's proceeded to take a spike nail and drive it through her head and nail her to a tree. Why? She risked her life for what we take for granted here in the United States. If I was going to preach a regular sermon this morning and I didn't intend for this to be one, Brother Tyler, I would talk about how that these people are, are tortured, are persecuted brothers and sisters in other countries risk their life to have one of these today. While the church in America leaves it on their pew to save their seat or on the shelf at home to gather dust. They risk their life to have the Word of God. And we take it for granted. I remember once Brother Swaggart told a story of a time whenever his ministry smuggled some Bibles into, I don't know if it was China or where it was, but he said they finally got them into the country and he said that they... They had to go down some back alleys and they had to go through some secluded areas and they had to go under the cover of night and not Brother Swagger, but the ones he had taken the Bibles in. And he said whenever they, got, they, they, got, they came to this place in this small dark room, this place of secrecy, and they brought the cases in there and they set them down and they began to hand out the Bibles. He said that the missionaries that had, that had taken them in there noted this. They said that the people would pick it up and they would look at it like this. And they would hold it to their chest and tears would roll down their face because they were holding God's Word. Yet in America today, we take it for granted. We don't pack it to church. We rarely open it. It's taken for granted so much to the place to now that many don't even bother to even own one. But they risk their lives for that. Yes, if I was going to preach this morning, I would talk about how that these and that girl that I just told you about. And if you notice on the, in the audio that we heard, these one people, I think it might have been the, the Peter who was dragged from what they called a Christian gathering. In other words, a place where a few people met to lift up Jesus, to draw strength from one another, to share maybe a passage of Scripture. I know in many of these countries I've heard missionaries tell of how that, they'll, that, that people there will only have just a piece of Scripture. They'll just have a page out of a Bible and just have a few Scriptures on it. and They will meet together and they'll exchange the paper that they have. Here, you can take my page out of the Bible and I'll take yours. And, and they, they'll, they'll meditate on that and they'll, they'll hold that deer and they'll, they'll feed spiritually upon that. Just papers, just, just sheets out of a Bible. 
because they can't have the whole thing. Today in America, these over here in these persecuted countries, these restricted areas, they risk their life to go to what we would call church and meet in places like basements and cellars and, and places that we would call dungeons or shacks or somewhere out in the woods or the hills or the sticks or whatever. Yet we have padded pews and air-conditioned buildings. And the church in America is so spoiled that eh, she'll go if she feels like it. She'll go if she wants to. She'll go if it's convenient. But if not, she'll just stay home. While our brothers and sisters in other countries risk their life to go to what we would consider the house of God or a place of worship or to gather together with Christians to pray or to worship or to fellowship, they risk their life for that. Yet in America, we, eh, we can do it if we want and if we don't, you know, it's okay. Because we're spoiled. Oh, I said we're spoiled. Amen. And these people who suffer persecution, who are beaten, who are tortured because of their faith in America, we don't know what persecution is yet. Someone can treat us funny because we're a Christian and we really think we've been persecuted. Someone can laugh at us because of our faith, because we don't fit in, Brother Tyler, because we don't fit into their clique or their religious thing that they've got going on. They'll make fun of us and call us old-fashioned or they'll call us those Jesus people. And we'll think we are really being persecuted. Oh, how am I going to withstand this persecution? How many times have you been drug off the street and taken into a room and beaten because of your faith in Christ? How many, time, how many nights have you spent in a prison cell because of your faith in Christ? No, America doesn't know what persecution is. America doesn't know what persecution is. And today as we remember our brothers and sisters that are in these countries persecuted for the cause of Christ. As I was reading and I was studying in this map that I have and the magazines that I have to give out and the, the bookmarks. I was reading of Rich, Richard Wormbrand who's the founder of The Voice of the Martyrs. He was in prison for some 14 years because of his faith in Jesus Christ. And he was tortured for Christ. He told of how that in prison there, of course, they didn't allow you to pray. When they found you praying, he said they would drag him from his cell and they would take him to the torture room and they would chain him down and they would take a stick or a bat or whatever we would call it. They would beat the bottoms of his feet until they bled. Then they would drag him back to his cell and throw him in there. And if they caught him praying, they'd drag him out again. And time and again they caught him praying because he refused to, get to, to let go of his faith in Jesus Christ. They beat him so mercilessly, his feet so mercilessly, mercifully, yeah, without mercy, they beat him so badly that he would never walk the same. Even after he was out of prison, he would never be able to walk right. He told the story of how that once he was sitting in his cell and he was praying and one of the guards that had took him so many times to the torture room to beat his feet looked in and saw him praying and he opened the door and he ran in there and he began to shout at him. He said, you fool! You've lost your wife. They had taken his wife captive. She was in a prison camp. You've lost your wife. Your son is an orphan. Your life is gone. And you still pray to this imaginary God. And the guard said, what else is there for you to pray for? And Richard Wormbrand looked up with his weathered face and his tear-filled eyes into the face of that guard and said, I was praying for you. Let that sink in this morning. And let it be a reminder of not only should we pray 
for our brothers and sisters who are persecuted, but we should pray for those that persecute them. We should pray for those that persecute them. <clears throat> Talking about those in other countries this morning, our brothers and our sisters, say, Brother Billy, what business is it of ours? We're in America. We should, <laughs> that's just a stupid question. We are all part of the body of Christ. If it affects them, it should affect us. They are our brothers and our sisters as much as the ones that were born from our mother's womb. Because they are born into the body of Christ through the blood of Jesus the same as we are. So we should pray this morning not only for the persecuted, but for those that persecute them. Matthew 5 and 43 says this. You have heard that it has been, that it has been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, these are the words of Jesus, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. This is Matthew 5 and 43. That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? In other words, if the only people you pray for are those who do you good, if the only people you love are those who love you back, then what reward have you? Because he was saying, well, the sinners or the publicans do. They do that. It's Matthew 5 and 43. I want to read that again. Matthew 5, 43. You have heard that it, that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Oh. Do the good to them that hate you. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Now keep this thought in mind. That when we talk about those that persecute our brothers and sisters across the seas. We're not talking about because they looked at them funny at church. We're not talking about because they found, oh, I found out that sister so-and-so had been talking about me to sister so-and-so. And I feel so persecuted and so hurt, I'll never forgive them for something as stupid as that. We're not talking about some piddly mess that we call persecution in the state. We're talking about people who pray and love those who drag them to the torture chambers and torture them and try to force them to denounce their faith in Christ. As the church sits here and says, tribulation's coming. It's far off in the distance. It's not here yet. You better hope it don't show up. Because the sissy church we've got in America today, 95% of it or more ain't going to make it. Because they ain't tough enough. Because one of the things that Richard Wurtenberg said, he said, there are those, and I, I think he was, I'm not sure it was Richard, I've heard some of audio, I don't know if it was, was him or not, or he may have been quoting from someone. There are those who believe in God, and then there are those who believe that they believe in God. And you find out the difference whenever you're faced with the choice, denounce your God, or die. He said as they threw him in there, he had to decide, did he really believe in God? Hallelujah. Pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. Every one of us under the sound of my voice need more of a burden for our brothers and sisters that are in chains but refuse to denounce Christ. That fear for their lives, but refuse to denounce Christ. We need to make this, we need to make them, not just a matter of prayer on the first Sunday of, the, of every November, but we need to make them a matter of prayer every day whenever we pray. We need to pray, Lord, please be with my brothers and sisters that are persecuted for the cause of Christ. 
Hebrews 13 and 3. Turn over there with me this morning. I'm not going to keep you very long. Hebrews 13 and 3. I'm going to read Brother Swaggart's notes with this. I normally don't do that. Sometimes I read them at the end of the verse, but I'm going to... I'm going to put them in here with this this morning, but I'll let you know which is which. Hebrews 13 and 3. Hebrews the 13th chapter, the third verse says, Remember them who are in bonds. And Brother Schweiger's note says, refers to Christians who were even then beginning to be imprisoned for their faith. The scripture goes on to read, As bound with them. And the note says, Become one with them, not forgetting to pray for them. In the Scripture, And them which suffer adversity, as being yourselves also in the body. And Brother Swagger says, refers to the body of Christ. And that if one suffers, in a sense all suffer. It says, remember them who are in bonds as bound with them. And them which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. Meaning that if our brothers and sisters overseas are suffering, we should feel that pain in the United States. Shame on preachers this morning that take the pulpit and proclaim that God wants all His people to be rich. And if you're not rich, you're not in God's will. Go over there in Africa into the jungles to their huts uh, where they scrape and scrunch for something to eat every day and tell them that. Take your prosperity mess uh, over into the, uh, into the jungles and over into the nations that are persecuted and tell them that God wants you to be rich and if you ain't rich, you're not in God's will. You're stupid. That is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. It has nothing to do with filthy lucre. They don't need you to go over there and tell them that the witch doctors and the sorcerers in those African villages don't need you to go over there and tell them your prosperity mess. They need to hear about Jesus. He's a chain breaker. He's a way maker. He's a soul saver. Hallelujah. It has nothing to do with your stupid cars and your stupid planes and your stupid home that costs millions of dollars and your stupid Armani suits. And I guarantee you that most of those mega churches and their pastor sashayed up there this morning didn't tell you about the persecuted church overseas. They just said, you're okay, I'm okay, we're all okay. Our brothers and sisters are not okay. I made this statement last week and I won't back down from it. Our brothers and sisters in these other countries are probably, are probably better off spiritually than the church in, in America. Their faith is stronger, I guarantee you that. Because as we heard this morning in the audio, those that risked their life for the Word are those that risked their life to go and be with other Christians. That takes a strong faith. To risk your life for that. To refuse to stop trying to get out and go somewhere and meet with a small gathering of people. Even at the risk of your own life, Brother Tyler. Yet today, someone can offend you and I ain't going back to church. Someone can look at you funny or not mention your name when they mention everyone else's or not pat you on the back when you wanted a pat on the back. And you can say, well, I'm not going back. See, that's the difference between the church overseas and the church in America. They go even though it's a, it, they are risking their life. The church in America, somebody can offend them by saying their meatloaf tasted bad and they ain't never going back to church. Bless their little heart. They'll sit at home in their bunny slippers and their fuzzy robe in their recliner and watch the TV preachers. Why? Because they don't know what real persecution is. We think tribulation is whenever Arby's runs out of roast beef. Amen? We think tribulation is whenever we things don't go our way. Talking about those in other countries persecuted this morning. Remember them. Write that scripture down. Don't forget it. Hebrews 13 and 3. Remember them 
who are in bonds as bound with them. And Brother Swagger Janot says, refers to Christians who were even then being imprisoned for their faith. He says, become one of them, not forgetting to pray for them. Then he says it refers to the body of Christ and that if one suffers, in a sense all suffer. 1 Corinthians 12 and 26 says, and whether one member suffer, all the members suffer. Talking about the body of Christ. All the members suffer with it. Or if one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Yet as they suffer, America's church takes their rest and their siesta and walks around in their lackadaisical lazy state. Yet as they starve, Americans prosper. As they don't know if they're like the, the girl that was locked in the room for three months and her brother would dig out the hole for her to lap up water and slide a little food under the door. And she would not denounce Christ. Her faith never wavered in her Savior. That today we are so ungrateful. If we don't have just that special thing that we want, we think we're really being deprived of something. God help us. Sadly, most for the most part, the church doesn't even take thought in the well-being of our brothers and sisters across the seas. When I tell you this morning that a militant of ISIS, when he finds a copy of a Bible in, our, in an Iraqi church, he burns the Bible because he doesn't want that influence. He doesn't want the, the influence of the Bible influencing the people. When a Muslim girl in Tanzania is found reading a Bible, her father beats her merc mercilessly. When the Vietnamese police raid a place where they are giving out Bibles, they confiscate Bibles the way that Amer in America we do guns or drugs. Yet in America, we take our Bibles for granted. Amen. I've told you this once, but I'll tell it to you again because I got way ahead of my notes. I'm getting ready to close. If I was going to preach a sermon this morning, I would talk to you about how they risked their life to have a Bible and how that we, the church in America, leave it at the church to save our pew or at home to gather dust or even bother having one anymore. I would talk about how they risked their life to do what we call church or to fellowship with believers. Well, the church here in America makes excuses to stay home. Or how we sit, how they would sit in the heat and the cold to hear a minister preach the Word of God, yet we cannot get people to fill our churches in America where a real man of God is preaching the Word of God without complaining. Well, I wish he'd hurry up. I heard a preacher years ago talk about going to Africa and preaching. And he said they would preach three services and it was hot. And he said the people would gather and he preached the same, the same message morning, noon, and night. And he said some of them people who came for the morning sermon, and they knew he was going to preach the same sermon later. They would sit there for the morning service. They would sit there until the second service started. They would sit there all through that service. They would not leave until the last service that night. In the heat of the day, with the flies and the bugs and the gnats. And the church today, we have padded pews and we have carpet on the floor and we have air conditioning and we have central air and heat. And we make excuse as to why we don't go to the church, of, to the house of the Lord. Amen. Listen to this. Go with me to Matthew 24. And let's read some of this far off distant future stuff that we're always talking about. Matthew 24 in closing. Matthew 24, we're going to start in the third verse and we know where this picks up. The disciples had asked Jesus, well, I think I've got this included. The third verse. And He said upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto Him privately saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. 
For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginnings of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Now I realize that Jesus is also talking about tribulation that never shall be, never has been, nor never shall be again, and how bad it's going to be. Amen? We realize that this morning. But for us to sit here on our padded pews in our air-conditioned buildings and look way off down somewhere and say, well, persecution is going to come. People are going to get killed for Jesus. It's already happening. Persecution has already came to our brothers and sisters in these other nations. And it's creeping into the United States through our government, through the ISIS groups, through the extreme Islamic terrorist groups. It's creeping in into our country. Not as bad as it is there. But who knows how long it'll be before it is. We sit on our padded pews in air-conditioned buildings while the preacher gives us a pep talk, a, message, a, a massage. Gives us a pep talk, a massage, a message on you're okay, I'm okay, we're all okay. And we think, oh yeah, one day tribulation's going to come. One day we're going to have to suffer. One day. The body of Christ is already suffering. And we should be aware of that today. And we should feel that today. The fact that our brothers and sisters are being killed and tormented and beaten and abused for the cause of Christ, we should feel that today. That should matter to us today. But I don't like to think about that. I want to think about just the roses and the prosperity and everything's going to be good and I can declare it all and speak it into existence and I'm a little God and I can do all these things. I don't want to think about all that stuff. Well, you need to think about all that stuff. You need to realize that the church of Jesus Christ is not confined within the, the borders of America. He has people all around this globe and they are facing persecution like they never have before. Story after story. Too many for me to relate to you this morning. Just the few that I heard yesterday or last night. Too many for me to tell you in the time that I have. But take my word for it this morning. There are Christians all around the world being persecuted and suffering for the cause of Christ. And the least, and I don't mean to minimize prayer, I'm just saying it is that you get the point of it. The least we can do is take time out of our busy, stressful day of things we've got to do and say a prayer for those that are persecuted for the cause of Christ. Remember them that are in bonds as bound with them and them which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. Ephesians 6 and 18 says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Remember them in prayer. And to help us with that this morning, I've got some of these I can't pick none up. Inside this magazine, there is a map like the one we have right here and up here. If you have a place, I would, I would, I would encourage you this morning, if you have a place at home, put it on your wall. That way it will help you to remember to pray for those that are persecuted. Whenever you see that map, stop and pray for them. Also have these. This little thing here that folds out. It has three different bookmarks inside there. They're real easy to come apart. Just fold it back and forth a couple times and they'll pop right into. And on the back of it, it says, Ten Ways to Pray. These are just suggestions. It has things for you to pray for our brothers and sisters. It says, pray that they will sense the presence of God. Pray that they will know that the greater body of Christ is lifting them up in prayer. Pray that they will experience God's comfort in their time of persecution. Pray that they will see God open doors. Pray that they can boldly share the gospel 
Pray that they can forgive and love their persecutors. Pray that they be granted wisdom to convert in covert. Granted wisdom in covert, meaning secretive ministry work. Remain joyful amid suffering. Mature in their faith. Be rooted in God's Word. At the bottom it says, I commit to pray for my persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ. And it has the scripture Hebrews 13 and 3 at the bottom of it. So stick one of these in your Bible. That way every time you open your Bible. And there's three of them on there if you have more than one Bible. Put them in each Bible that you have. It'll help you to remember to pray for them. The poster will help you to remember to pray for them. The bookmark will help you to remember to pray for them. And you may be thinking today, what can I do? You may look around today and see all these empty seats and think, what can we, just a few people do? What difference can one person make? Well, I'm glad you asked me that. <clears throat> Give me five more minutes and I'll tell you. It was because of one man's burden, that man being Nehemiah, that the walls of Jerusalem were rebuilt. It was because of three men standing and refusing to bow that, that caused the king's heart to be changed with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It was because one man refused to stop praying that the decree of the king was changed. Talking about Daniel in the lion's den. It was because of one little shepherd boy who came down to bring some lunch to his coward brothers who spoke these words. Oh, is there not a cause? That caused Israel to wrought a great victory that day. It was because one man found grace in the eyes of the Lord and obeyed the word of God and built an ark that mankind was preserved during the great flood. I don't have to go on this morning. If you, know the, if you know the Word of God for yourself, you know that all throughout the Word of God we see time and time again how the Lord has always done great things with just one, two, or a very few. Can I quote to you one last scripture this morning? The ending of it anyway, James 5 and 16 says, The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous, great number of people, great multitude, a mass congregation, it says the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man. A single, solitary man with his faith rooted and grounded in Jesus Christ, washed in the blood. What a difference his prayers can make. What a difference your prayers can make today. Your witness makes a difference. Your testimony makes a difference. Your prayers can make a difference today. Amen? The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man does no good. That's not what it says. He said, "Is availeth it availeth much. We should not be saying today that we can that I can't do anything. What we should be saying is that our God can do anything. Our God can do anything. There is nothing. We can sit today and say, well, we're just a few little people. I'm just a low, I'm just one person. It's impossible for me. We should be standing and testifying that nothing is impossible with God. And your prayers, your testimony, your witness in the hands of a God who can take nothing and make something out of it can go a long way, church. It can go a long way. So this morning. Let each one of us here and each one under the sound of my voice determine, resolve to pray not only for our brothers and sisters here in the United States, not only for one another at church, but for our persecuted brothers and sisters across the seas. And Brother Rodney, don't let it stop there. But pray for those that persecute them to be saved as well. Richard Wormbrand said he won many to Jesus during his time in prison. William Tyndale, one of the great, great men of God. He's the reason, one of the great reasons that we have the King James Version today. He's, while he was in prison for the cause of Christ, the jailer was one, the jailer's daughter was one, the jailer's family was one. So let's pray for them today that they can be a witness where they're at. If they can witness to people in the face of their persecution, surely we can witness to people 
in the land of the free, in the home of the brave. Lord, help us not to take for granted our freedom and help us to remember our persecuted brothers and sisters across the seas. Anyone else this morning have something before we go?